Um, yeah, as you already said, I'm going to talk about generic important sampling via optimal control for stochastic reaction networks today. And um, before I start, I want to show you some faces. So this is a joint work with my uh, supervisors and colleagues, um, Professor Royal Tampona, Nadia ben Ratchet from Leeds University in the UK, Shiab um, ben Hamuda from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and this talk is based on two of my papers. The first one, um, we call this the learning-based approach, is published in Statistics and Computing. And the second one, um, which is the Markovian projection-based approach, is available as a preprint, but also submitted to a journal. Um, the central aim of my work and also of this talk um, is estimating rare event probabilities in the setting of stochastic reaction networks. In fact, this means we are interested in estimating this expected value, which is the expected value of some observable of a stochastic reaction network at final time t. And here's the stochastic reaction network is a stochastic process. And um, more specifically, the observable in our case is some indicator function such that the um, final state of the stochastic reaction network is within some set B. And if we choose the set B um, such that we get an event, we are interested in estimating this probability here. The methods in order to achieve this, um, which I use, are um, important sampling. And we combine stochastic optimal control with important sampling in order to get an efficient estimator for this quantity of interest. Um, and one of the main challenges with this is the curse of dimensionality, which occurs if we have higher dimensional stochastic reaction networks. So D is larger than one. Okay, this is the central aim. Um, in this talk, I will first generally introduce stochastic reaction networks, show you how to um, simulate them, how to do a Monte Carlo estimator on them, speak about rare event in the setting and important sampling. And then section two and three are the main part of my talk in which I will first introduce in way of import, uh, optimal important sampling in the sense of a variance minimization. And then in section three, show you how to lower the effect of the curse of dimensionality. Um, and we have there two approaches, the learning-based approach and the Markovian projection-based approach. And for both of these approaches, I will also show some numerical results. And then at the end, there's a short conclusion. Okay. Stochastic reaction networks um, were originally introduced to model chemical reactions, um, especially in the setting where we have a small number of molecules. Because in this setting, um, it is not sufficient anymore to model the system deterministically because stochastic effects are dominating. And in stochastic reaction network, we model the stochastic effects by Poisson random variables or more specifically Poisson processes. Um, we have various applications for stochastic reaction networks. So we can, for example, use them to model epidemic processes um, in a setting where we have a small population. So for example, here we have the SIR model. I guess most of you have seen this in the context of Corona. We can also use this to model the transcription and translation in genomics and virus kinetics. So here's an example with a genetic switch where we can switch on and off the gene and then produce or not produce mRNA and a protein. Uh, we can also use this to model manufacturing supply chains and logistic networks. Um, or we can use this to model chemical or more precisely biochemical reactions. And um, one commonly used example for this is the Michael and Elismant and enzyme kinetics, uh, which you see here. Um, and I will use this example to draw out my talk to demonstrate um, the approaches. Okay. Um, a stochastic reaction network is a continuous time but discrete state Markov process. Um, and we are modeling the number of molecules per species over time. Um, and therefore we <clears throat> take a d-dimensional vector where d is equal to the number of difficult different uh, molecule types in the system and then stack them. And then the i-th entry is corresponding to the number of the i-th molecule. And um, yeah, what we are aiming for is, you can see this in the plot. So we have the x-axis, which is the time. And then we are interested in the number of molecules for, in this example, we have four different species um, over time. The dynamics or the reactions are driven through so-called reaction channels. 
and direction channel consists of the stoichiometric vector, which is giving how the number of molecules are changing with one instance of this reaction. And the propensity function, or also called jump intensity function, which is related to the likelihood of a reaction or a jump within the next time interval. So more precisely, this means um, for the propensity function, um, the probability that in the next small time interval delta t, we have a reaction of, uh, of, of kind j is equal to the propensity function times the length of this small time interval delta t plus an O delta t term. And um, here you can already see that the propensity function is dependent on the current state. And more precisely in our applications, um, we use the mass action kinetic principle um, to model the jump intensity, which is given here. And this function guarantees that um, whenever we have um, a lot of molecules which are consumed by one reaction, this um, jump intensity function is high, such that the reaction is very likely. And if we have less consumed molecules, um, it becomes smaller. And even if one reaction is not possible, so for example, if we take a reaction where two molecules are consumed, but only one mo molecule is available, then this indicator term, uh, indicator function here, assures that then the propensity function is zero, which means that this reaction is not possible at this time point. And this also assures, assures that the uh, process will be non-negative at any time point. Okay, having this, um, we now want to simulate stochastic reaction networks. And there we have in general, um, oh, sorry, I think actually I missed one slide. Okay, but we will continue here. Um, so, um, in order to model stochastic reaction networks, um, yeah, I will quickly go to the slide. Um, we usually, I'm sorry that the slide is missing, define them by so-called codes random time shreds representation, which is not given on this slide, but I will quickly quickly explain it with the help of this slide. Um, codes random time shreds representation is the exact distribution of the process, and it um, models the process uh, in terms of um, Poisson processes. Um, this means we have basically the structure here in the gray box, <laughs> but instead of um, having here a Poisson random variable, we would have a uh, Poisson process and the parameter would be given by an integral over the propensity function. Um, and this is driving the dynamics of the stochastic process. I'm sorry that I um, missed the slide in the presentation. Okay, um, and next we are interested in modeling a stochastic reaction network in order to get an estimator. And for simulating, we have in general two different options. So we can model the exact process, which is would be given in terms of the Poisson process, or we can model the a pathwise approximate scheme. And um, the pathwise exact process would model the exact stochastic distribution. Um, this is usually done in terms of waiting times, which are given for a Poisson process by exponential waiting times. Um, and a very famous algorithm for this is the stochastic simulation algorithm, SSA or Gillespie's algorithm. Um, but there are also other exact schemes such as the modified next reaction method. Um, however, this approach becomes computationally expensive whenever one of direction channels fires frequently. Um, and yeah, therefore we, we don't have a bias. This is an exact method, but it can be expensive. And to overcome this, we have on the other hand side, a pathwise approximate scheme. Um, there we model the process on a discrete time grid. Mm, this becomes computationally cheaper, but we introduce an additional bias term. So for example, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, plot here, you can see the discrete scheme with a very coarse time step of 20. Here, the peak is going up to 200, where at, whereas the exact process is only peaking to 60. So we clearly have some bias term here. Um, very famous examples for this pathwise approximate scheme is the Tau-Leap scheme, um, but there are also more elaborated schemes such as the split-step implicit Tau-Leap scheme. In um, my work, I'm usually focused on, on the Tau-Leap scheme, um, and also our important sampling will be based on this Tau-Leap scheme. Um, the idea of the explicit Tau-Leap scheme is basically we use 
an explicit Euler version, forward Euler version for the setting of stochastic reaction networks. And um, therefore, we use a time grid, um, which in our case is usually a uniform time grid with step size delta t, but this can generally apply to any time grid. And then um, what we do is basically we assume that the propensity function is constant with each, uh, within each time grid. Um, and by doing so, we result in the in the um, sampling screen, which is given here in the gray box. So we have the initial value, and then um, we can always get the value at time n by using the value at time n minus 1. And then we have here sum over the different reaction channels, um, where we basically just count how often each reaction takes place in the last time interval and mu multiply this times the stoichiometric vector nu j. Um, and this stoichiometric vector nu j is giving how the number of molecules are changing with one instance of the reaction. Um, yeah, if I would have included the previous slide with the quits random time change representation, you would clearly see that now in this explicit scheme, we are using a Poisson random variable instead of a Poisson process. And also the parameter is no longer given by an integral, but by the propensity function of the current time step times delta t. Um, yeah, this is a discrete time uh, discrete pro discretization, and we have some bias term. And therefore, um, it can happen that we get negative values within our state vector, um, which would correspond to a negative molecule count for some molecule types. Since this is physically not feasible, we apply the maximum with zero at each time step. So we basically project to zero to obtain non-negative values at each iteration step. Okay, having a way to sample a stochastic reaction network, we can now build a Monte Carlo SDA meter. And for a given observable G, um, this is straightforward. We just simulate a set of M sample path, apply the observable to the final time of the sample path, and then take the average. Um, this comes with the two sources of error. So the global error can, to, can be split into a bias term and a statistical error. And the bias can be shown to be of order delta t for the setting of tau leaf, whereas the statistical error can be shown with the help of the central limit theorem to be approximately given by a constant times the square root of the variance um, divided by the sum, uh, number of sample path. And um, you can clearly see here that the um, bias can be controlled by using a smaller time stepping, and the um, statistical error can be controlled by using more sample path. But however, we still have an impact which is given by the variance here in the statistical errors. And this means that if we have a high variance, um, which is the case in the setting of rare events, uh, we need a lot of sample path in order to control the statistical error. OK, let's have a closer look at rare events for stochastic reaction networks. Um, first of all, in general, a, stochastic, a, a rare event is an event which appears, occurs with very small probability. Um, but it can be very crucial for the given application. So if we, for example, consider a pandemic context um, in which we are interested in the event that the hospital, hospital beds are too small, then this is a priori a very small probability, but it would be very crucial to have a good estimate for this um, in order to, for example, act politically. Um, in our context, we are interested in events of the shape that one of the species is just, uh, exceeding a threshold at final time. So for example, here's the Michaelis Menten enzyme kinetic example, and we would be interested uh, in the event that the complex, which is the green species, is succeeding a threshold of 22 at final time. And here can, you can already see within this 20 sample path, which are given here with decent small time stepping, this is not happening. And also if we simulate a thousand or maybe even 10,000 more path, it's still very unlikely that we have even one path hitting this threshold. And that's because we have here a rare bond of order 10 to power minus five. Um, but this makes it also very difficult to find a good estimator for this rare event since it's basically almost never occurring. Um, the crude forward estimator with the help of Monte Carlo would be to use an indicator function. Um, and this indicator function is then basically, or this whole estimator basically just means we are counting how often um, the rare event is occurring. And then uh, we take the relative, um, relative occurrence of this event. 
Um, okay, speaking in variance, um, this has a very high, high variance, um, this indicator function. Um, and I think it's also um, in a naive way, very clear that it's difficult to estimate because if we use the number of sample paths, which is too small, the ray event will not occur, occur, which means that the estimator is uh, zero, giving us a high relative error. And um, even if we have one event which is hitting this threshold, we still don't have an accurate estimate for this rare event probability. Um, so in fact, this means we have here a high variance, which means we require a very high number of paths, and this results in a high computational cost. Um, more precisely, if we would estimate this event and want to have a relative tolerance of 5%, we would require two times 10 to power eight path. These are 200 million path. And I can tell you this will take quite some time to simulate. Um, and that's why we are using important sampling to avoid this uh, high computational cost. Um, this is the general introduction to important sampling. So in important sampling, we are interested in estimating some expected value of an observable of some random variable y. And that for this, we use an auxiliary nonverbal z with some density rho hat. And then we can reformulate the expected value with respect to y by writing down the integral and then taking the, uh, then multiplying and dividing through the density of the random variable z. Um, and then on the right hand side, we get that this is the same as the expected value with respect to z um, applied to g times some likelihood factor. And this likelihood factor is given by the original density divided through the new density. And in fact, in many applications, this likelihood factor can be derived in closed form. This means now we can estimate the same expected value by using the auxiliary random variable z. And this means we can also find a Monte Carlo estimator for the right-hand side instead of for the quantity of the left-hand side. Um, however, if we do a good choice in the z, we can reduce the variance of the right-hand side estimator. And well, as I already indicated, smaller variance mean we means we need less sample path and therefore we are computationally faster. What does this mean in the setting of stochastic reaction networks? So on the left-hand side, we, you see the plot you have seen before. This is the um, just tau leap applied to um, the Michael's mental enzyme kinetic example. Um, and then on the right hand side, you see the same example, but under important sampling. And this means we are changing the underlying distribution of the path. And then by multiplying each of the path times the likelihood factor, we can still get an unbiased estimator for our quantity of interest. So it's basically changing the distribution of the path, the sampling scheme, and then weighting them times, times some weighting term to get um, an estimator of the same rare event probability. Um, however, if this important sampling is doing in a good way, we reduce the variance. And this can be seen here in the fact that the rare event is no longer a rare event under the new important sampling scheme. So we are frequently hitting this threshold. And this means that we need less path in order to control the statistical error. The question is now how to find such an important sampling. And this is already a sneak peek to uh, one of the final approaches um, because we do not just want to look at the problem and um, arbitrarily change some rates and then hopefully get a, get a good important sampling. Um, no, we want to do this in a automatic, systematic way, such that we um, not only find good important sampling, but the important sampling, which is reducing the variance and therefore the statistic error as much, much as possible. So we are looking for the important sampling, which needed, needs the least path in order to estimate our quantity of interest. And to do so, we are now using the notion of stochastic optimal control. Okay, um, first of all, arbitrary, it will not be possible to consider all possible measure, measure changes, and therefore we restrict ourselves to a parametrized important sampling scheme. And this parametrized important sampling scheme is based on the um, tau leap scheme. The tau leap scheme is uh, 
repeated here. And you remember the main part of the Fadib scheme was we have Poisson random variables, which are based on the propensity function times delta t. Our important sampling scheme is now still having the same structure as the tau leap, but instead of using the propensity function, we are introducing an important sampling control parameter, delta. And this delta is now chosen for each time step, each reaction channel j, and for each state x. So it's basically not just, not just one um, parameter, but an infinite set of parameters. Um, and I want to note out here that especially um, this, this x is increasing the dimensionality of this parameter set because x is the stochastic reaction network, which is d-dimensional. So we have exponentially in d many parameters here. And um, this parameter set, um, which we choose, is um, obeying this admissible set. So we have a parameter 0 whenever the propensity function is equal to 0, and otherwise it's a strictly positive parameter. Yeah, but as I said, it is a very large parameter set, and this will make it difficult to determine this parameter such that the variance of our estimator is reduced as much as possible. OK. In order to determine these parameters, we are now using stochastic optimal control theory. And therefore, um, we first def define the value function. Um, in control theory, this value function is also referred to as optimal cost to go function or optimal reward function. In our setting, it is the optimal second moment, because minimizing the second moment means also minimizing the variance in our setting. And then this value function is defined as the optimal second moment in the important sampling scheme, given that at time n we are in state x. So it's basically we only consider for a fixed time and a fixed state how the process is evolving afterwards. And then the second moment is with respect to the important sampling. Um, and this means we have here a g squared terms times the likelihood factor squared. And over this term, we take now the infimum over the control parameters. OK, um, a small note on this. Usually in stochastic optimal control, one has a um, sum here instead of product, so an additive structure in, uh, instead of a multiplicative one. Um, however, we have here a product, and therefore the derivation of the following equations will be slightly different than in usual um, or in common stochastic optimal control um, applications. Um, however, we still use the structure and the notion. And um, I also want to note here that this likelihood factor um, is given in terms of a product, since we can find a likelihood term for each of the time steps of tau leap um, based on the used Poisson random variables. And therefore, we have here a product, product over the time steps. OK. We now want to find this optimal control parameters and also this, this value function for each time step and each state. And therefore, um, we were able to find a dynamic programming relation, which allows us to find the value function in a set of backward equations. So this means we have the value function given in closed form. This is just from the definition of the previous slide. And then we can find the value function for any time part n and any time part x by this minimization, this infimum here, which is now an infimum only of the, over the uh, control parameters of the current time step and not um, all par control parameters. And the term on the right hand side is also dependent on the um, value function at time n plus one. So in theory, we could now start at final time and then backward propagate in time in order to get the value function and the control parameter for each time step. And this would be the optimal variance minimizing um, important sampling scheme without within our parameterized scheme. However, this is not feasible for most applications because we have here this, this infimum, which is still not non-trivial to so solve, and also we have here an infinite sum. And that's why we have um, slightly changed the notation and switched to um, a continuous time value function. So we have here a value function, which a uh, utility, which is continuous in time, but still discrete in the time stepping. And also the control um, parameters are now continuous in time, but still discrete with respect to the um, reaction channels and with respect to the um, state vector x. And if we do this continuous um, formulation, we can show that the value function fulfills this set of Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman 
um, differential equations. A short note, usually hamilton jacobi bellman is referring to a set of PDEs. In our case, it is just an um, ODE because we have still discrete states here. And you can see this hamilton jacobi bellman equation has a very similar structure to the dynamic programming from the previous state, state, uh, slide. So we have still um, the final time given in closed form, and we still have this minimum over the control parameters at time t. Okay, um, if we now further assume that our value function is strictly positive, in that case, we can solve the hamilton jacobi bellman equation in closed form, um, which means we can get rid of the uh, infimum here in the slide and um, get this formulation. And also, and this is maybe the most important thing here, we can also get the optimal control parameters in closed form by a relation to the value function. This is this blue equation here. Um, OK, however, when we use an um, indicator function as observable, we cannot as assure that utility is strictly positive because the indicator function will take zero values for some regions. And in order to um, overcome this issue, we use an, a smoothing of a Vian um, sigmoid function, um, which assures that we are strictly positive for any x um, at final time. And having this, we can then uh, use the hamilton jacobi bellman equation in closed form in order to find our control parameters. Um, I want to note that we do the smoothing only to get the control parameters. And whenever we do a forward run to finally get the estimator of error very event probability, we use the exact true observable. So this smoothing will might introduce a bias in the set of control parameters, but it's not introducing an additional bias to the um, final estimator of our event probability. OK, there's still one issue with this hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which is that it scales exponentially with the dimension d. So it becomes for a stochastic reaction network where a lot of different species are interacting with each other, this becomes very um, expensive to solve. And um, to overcome this, we have developed um, two different approaches. Um, the first approach, we call it the learning-based approach, um, is based on using an ansatz function for the value function with a smaller set of parameters. And then we do stochastic optimization to learn these parameters. Um, there's already one YouTube talk online on this um, topic of the learning-based approach. So if you're interested in more details, please have a look in this um, recording from the last year's uh, seminar talk. And then the alternative approach for this is Markovian um, projection-based, in which we do some um, dimension reduction. OK, I will quickly speak about the learning-based approach and show you some numerics, and then um, also give some details on the Markovian projection-based approach. In the learning-based approach, um, we have, OK, you remember we have the um, value function, which is given here. So this um, was defined before. This is equivalent to the cost to go function. And we now use some ansatz function, which we call u hat, to approximate this value function. And this function u hat is also dependent on a set of parameters, which we call um, beta. However, the set of parameters beta is way smaller than the set of control important sampling control parameters delta. So in fact, this, this beta is in our numerical experiments just d plus one parameters. And then we do some stochastic optimization. Um, you can think about an um, gradient descent algorithm or an alg uh, Adam algorithm in order to optimize this beta. And whenever we do a forward step, um, so whenever we need to simulate important sampling with a given beta parameter set, we use the relation between the value function and the control parameters, which we have derived from the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. This means um, whenever we have any parameter set beta, um, we can um, evaluate the corresponding um, ansatz function and then always get also control parameters from this, which might not yet be optimal if beta is not optimal. 
Okay, how does this look in our Array event um, application? So if we take this kind of observable with an indicator function, in our numerical results, we have seen that an uh, sigmoid, sigmoid is giving good um, results as an ansatz function. And in fact, we use a formulation of the sigmoid where we have two sets of parameters, um, this red parameters and this blue parameters. And this um, red parameters are fitting the sigmoid at final time. This is what we have given in closed form. So fitting the indicator function. So we can a priori define beta zero and um, B zero to fit this, the position and the steepness of the, the slope of the indicator function. And then um, for any other time point, um, we have the blue parameters, which determine how the slope is changing over time. So it's defining how the slope is tilted and how the position of the slope is evolving for all other time points. This um, blue parameter set um, are the parameters which we learn in our learning-based approach. Okay, more precisely, how does this learning is working? So remember, we are still interested in minimizing variance or more precisely minimizing the second moment. And for any given parameter beta, we can get um, an important sampling scheme by um, evaluating the value function for this beta and then use the relation between control parameters and the value function in order to get important sampling control parameters. This means we have for any beta a corresponding important sampling scheme. And we are now minimizing the second moment over this um, important sampling scheme. So this is the second moment of important sampling with respect to beta. So this is a g squared at final time and then the likelihood factor squared. And this is what we are aiming to minimize with respect to beta. And to do so, we do stochastic optimization. Um, and in fact, we were able to find a closed form gradient to minimize this with respect to beta. And this closed form um, gradient is given on this slide. So this is the partial derivative with respect to beta of the second moment of important sampling with respect to beta. And the second moment is given without in going to, into too much details. The second moment is given um, as an expected value over sample path with respect to beta. And this means um, for any given beta, we can run some sample path in order to get a Monte Carlo estimator for the second expected value. And this, yeah, the second expected value is then an estimator for our partial derivative. And then we do some in gradient descent, some steps towards the, the great, steepest gradient and then um, minimize um, our function step by step. Okay, plugging everything together, the procedure is now we take our stochastic reaction network, we make some ansatz um, about the value function, take some initial parameter, then we run a few sample paths with the current initial beta parameters. Um, based on this, we evaluate a, gra a gradient, and then we update the parameter beta, run again some path, drive the gradient, and we loop this until we have decent variance reduction. Okay, let's quickly talk about the computational complexity of this approach. So we're interested in um, reaching a pre-swipe tolerance of toll. And um, therefore, um, the computational cost of this approach is split into two parts. First, we have some offline cost, which is for learning the parameter beta. So this is the cost um, of this loop. Um, and this cost mainly depends on how many iterations, so how often we need to run the loop until we get um, decent variance reduction is, and also how many paths we need in order to estimate our um, partial derivative in each step. And it also depends on which step size we use for the, for the path, which we use for the learning. And then the second um, part of the cost is um, given by the forward propagation. So this is where we actually derive our estimator. And um, this depends, first of all, on the um, on the step size, which is determined by the tolerance. And we choose this such that the bias is controlled. And then also dependent on the number of um, samples path we need for our estimator. And this is can be derived. Um, this is chosen such that the statistical error is controlled. And yeah, we can then reformulate this that this means this is equal to um, 
the offline cost, which I have discussed, plus um, some constant times the variance of the final um, beta times tall to power minus three. And if we compare this now to the standard tally Monte Carlo approach, um, we can see that we still have the same order with respect to the tolerance. Um, however, the final, obje uh, the final objective was to minimize this variance. So this means in the standard Talib approach, we have here a, a term a variance, which is much higher than the one in the important sampling approach. In fact, we reduced this variance by a factor of 50, 100, or even 1,000. Um, and this means um, that the, the, the offline cost um, can be neglected compared to the forward cost, which we have reduced um, significantly. Okay, finally, I want to show you some numerical results. Um, so we have here again the 4D example, which are the uh, Michaelis Menten enzyme kinetic example with uh, three reactions. And then we have the second example, which is a 6D example um, with six reactions. And um, in this plot, <clears throat> you see on the x axis the optimizer steps. So this is basically um, the loops in the um, sketch you have seen before. And then the black approach is our important sampling approach. Um, and then the dashed red line is, in comparison, the standard tau leap approach. So you can see here, this is an array event of order 10 to the power minus 5. And in the second plot, this is the squared coefficient of variation, which is a scaled version of the variance, so basically a relative variance. Um, you can see that we have right away a very good variance reduction with the initial parameters beta, and then you even minimize this a little further, such that we finally get a variance reduction of the factor of 4 times 10 to power 3, which means we would need um, 4,000 path, a factor of 4,000 path less in order to get the same accuracy as the standard tau leap approach. And on the lower part, you also see how the um, parameters evolve. So we have here five parameters, which we have learned, where some of them are overlapping. And then um, we also checked that um, the kurtosis, which is an indicator, of, of indicator for um, the variance of the um, sample variance. OK. Um, a small note, how we can additionally reduce the computational cost of this learning-based approach. Um, as you have seen before, we can do the learning approach for a different step size than the final um, estimator itself. So the final estimator step size is determined by controlling the bias. But however, we can do the learning with the coarser time step, which will save additional cost. And in this plot, you can see here, we did the learning with the step size of two to the power minus four, and then applied the same parameters, which we got from this learning run to finer time steps. And you can see that we get um, around the same factor of variance reduction, even if we apply this to much finer time scripts. Okay, and the final example is the 60 example. Um, yeah, maybe very quickly. In this example, we got a variance reduction of a factor of 50. Um, so this is a rare event, which is even more rare than the previous one, 10 to power minus 6. And here, the factor of variance reduction is um, around a factor of 50. OK, having this, um, a few general re remarks to the learning-based approach. Um, this approach works good if we have a suitable ansatz function. So in the setting of rare events with this indicator, function we have used. We have seen that sigmoids are very powerful. However, if we have some other array event observable, it might be necessary to use another shape of ansatz function. Um, we, you could, for example, also think about a small neural network. Um, our partial derivative um, can be applied to any kind of ansatz function if it's differentiable. Um, so we will always have the um, partial derivative with respect to the second moment uh, and it applies to different kinds of ansatz functions if needed. Our second approach, um, the Markovian projection approach, is a variance reduction approach. Um, and in this approach, um, we first reduce the dimensionality of the stochastic reaction network and then solve a lower dimensional hamilton jacobi bellman equation um, and then map the parameters which we get from this to the full dimensional system. OK, what does this mean? Um, first, let us talk about Markovian projection. Um, the idea is, um, since our observable is only related to one of the species, the idea is to only 
model the species of interest. So say we are interested in a projection of the full dimensional stochastic reaction network X to one of the species. This is can given by a projection P. Um, and the question is, if there's a process with, which mimics this projection, but without needing to simulate the other three species, which we don't need. So basically, um, can we only simulate the screen curves without simulating the three other species? Um, this projection um, can be either to one dimension, this is what we do in our numerical results, um, but you could also think about a projection to a smaller, um, to some other dimension, um, which is not one, but smaller than D. And then we talk about dimension D bar in the setting. Okay, and in fact, there is a possibility to do this. Um, so we have here, first a small recap, the exact formulation of the stochastic reaction network, which is given in terms of the Poisson process with an integral here. And then uh, we are considering the projection, um, which we call capital S, and then the Markovian projection theorem here um, shows us that there is in fact such a mimicking process, which we call S bar and which is only D bar dimensional, such that conditioned on the initial value, the conditional distribution of the exact process projected and the mimicking process are the same for any time point T. So this basically means we can recover the conditional distribution at any time point, even though we don't simulate the full D-dimensional process. This pro process S bar um, has this shape, which is given here, and you can see the structure is very similar to the exact process. So it is a D-bar pro uh, dimensional process, so we project um, the initial value and we project the stoichiometric vector. And we still have this um, shape that we have the sum over the um, reaction channels over, propens uh, over stochastic processes. And we still have the integral, but the propensity function of this new process S bar, um, A bar is a little bit different. It depends now on time as well. So before the propensity function is only dependent on the state. Now it depends on the time and the spate of the D dimensional, D bar dimensional process. And A bar is given by the conditioned expected value, conditioned that at time t, x of t, uh, the projection of x of t is equal to s, um, and then over the propensity function of x of t. Some further remarks on this. Um, first of all, this conditioned um, expected value is not always given in closed form, but there are settings of um, propensity functions where we can get A bar in closed form. So if we, for example, consider the setting um, that we project to the first species x1 and the propensity function has the shape of some constant theta times x1, then um, this expected value is given in closed form since we condition on s and it's just given by theta times s. In other cases, this will not be possible. Um, and also we have the case um, where this projection of the stoichiometric vector just becomes zero. Um, and this means that there are some reactions which are not seen by the Markovian projection. So some of the reactions are not relevant for Markovian projection. And any other reaction which is not given in, for which A bar is not given in closed form and which have um, P of nu J unequal zero, we call the set um, script JMP, we do um, some L2 regression in order to derive A bar. So first of all, we can reformulate this conditioned expected value by this um, formulation here where we minimize over some function space V. Um, and then we have the time integral of the um, squared, expected value of the squared difference of A and H. And um, we can then use, if we want to use a tau leap path in order to solve this L2, we basically step to a, a discrete time stepping. So the, we have discrete, discretized the integral and also um, to using a Monte Carlo estimator for this expected value. And um, yeah, using this, we can do then again, you solve this with a normal equation in order to find some suitable function H. Um, this function space, um, in our simulations, we use just a polynomial function space, um, which has a degree two in time and space. Um, but it might be needed um, to use some larger function space or some different kind of uh, basis in order to find the, uh, the, the function A bar. 
Okay, having Markovian projection, we can now directly drive important sampling from this. And therefore, what we do is we take the full dimensional stochastic reaction network, which is d dimensional. Then we run some Monte Carlo, uh, some Tau leap path, sorry, run some Tau leap path in order to drive the um, propensity function for the Markovian projection process. So do some L2 regression. And then we have the d bar dimensional process or the dynamics of the d bar dynamical process. And next, we can now solve the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation for this d bar dimensional process. So before we have solved this for a d dimensional process, now we only solve this for a d bar dimensional process. Um, and in fact, in our simulations, d bar is even equal to one. So we are solving this now just to um, a one dimensional state space. Um, and this will significantly reduce the computation cost of solving the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations. So what we could now do is we could basically use um, this, this control parameters and apply it to the um, Markovian projection, the bar dimensional process, and use this as estimator. However, this would have an additional bias from the L2 regression. And therefore, what we do is we now project this um, control parameters, which we got in the lower dimension, back to the full dimension process. And um, in fact, this projecting to the full dimension process is in working in the such that for any time point t and any state where we want to get a control parameter in the d dimension process, we just project um, the state with the help of our projection and then address the d bar dimension value function at the corresponding um, state in order to get in control. This does not guarantee us to get the optimal control parameters. Um, however, in our numerical results, we got very good variance reduction with this approach. And also, we don't have an additional bias from, as I said, from using L2 regression in order to get A bar by this projection to the full dimensional process. OK, before showing you some final numerical results, um, let's quickly talk about the computational cost. Um, so we are still interested in um, estimating a prescribed tolerance, uh, error tolerance toll. Um, and as in the previous approach, we have here two sources. We have some offline costs and some cost from finally deriving the estimator. The offline cost in this case splits into the Markovian projection cost and then the cost for solving the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. The Markovian projection post, uh, cost is mostly dependent on how many paths we need to simulate in order to do our L2 regression, on the time stepping we use, um, and also on the size of the basis we use in order to uh, do the L2 regression for the functions A bar. And then the hamilton jacobi bellman um, for the cost for solving the hamilton jacobi bellman equation mostly depends on the dimension D bar. So on how to which dimension we can project the process. And the forward cost um, is basically the same term as we have seen before. So we have some time stepping with the, is used, uh, is chosen such the bias and control is controlled. And then we have some number of sample path which control the statistical error. And by this, we get then a final cost, which is given by some offline learning, learning cost for driving the important sampling parameters and then some online cost. Um, which is mainly dependent on the variance times tall to power minus three. And we can do here the same comparison as before, um, especially in a setting for very small tolerances and very um, small array events. Um, our, the the um, learning cost for the control parameters will be neglectable such that we can um, reduce the, co the total cost with our approach. Okay, in fact, to show you how this is working, I have two numerical examples. So we have here, um, again, the Michael Menten enzyme kinetic example, which is a 4D example. And then we have a 6D example, which has 10 different reactions. And um, before going to the important sampling, I want to show you um, that we truly can derive the conditional distribution at final time. So you see here two histograms for the for both examples um, where we have the relative occurrences of states at final time. And we compare at the one hand side in red, the projection of the full dimensional process to the species of interest. And in, in blue, we have the Markovian projection where we only simulate the species of interest. And you can see that these histograms are mostly overlapping, showing us that this distribution um, is truly the same as the 
um, theorem was telling us. Okay, and then now we do important sampling um, with the help of the Markovian projection. Um, we have here on the x-axis different um, time discretization steps. Um, and on the left, you see the sample mean, where in blue, we compare the Markovian projection important sampling um, with the standard Talib approach in red. Um, this is still a relevant of 10 to the power minus 5. And you can see on the right hand side that we um, reduce the variance by a factor 10 to the power 6 for decent small delta t, um, which means we need a factor of 1 million path less in order to get the same um, error. With the, with the novel approach compared to the standard Talib approach. Okay, and um, finally, um, we have the 60 example. So this is only a relevant of 10 to power minus three, so a little bit less rare. And in this example, we get a variance reduction of a factor 500 for decent small delta t. Okay, um, a small final remark on this approach. Um, it might be the case that there are examples where a projection to just d bar equal to one is not sufficient. And in this case, um, we advise to do some adaptive uh, Markovian projections. So first project to one dimension, and if the desired um, variance reduction is not achieved, then project to two dimensions and so on until we have enough variance reduction. However, projecting to um, d bar equal to two or higher will also significantly increase the cost of the hamilton jacobi bellman equations. Okay, and um, with this, I want to end my talk. Um, you have seen that we have designed an efficient Monte Carlo estimator for estimating relevance for a stochastic reaction network. Um, this was mostly done by an automatic path dependent measure change where we used important sampling and stochastic optimal control to find it. And um, we have observed the curse of dimensionality and tackled it with two different approaches, where the first approach is the learning-based approach, where we use some ansatz function and then some parameter learning um, via stochastic optimization. And the second approach was the Markovian projection approach, where we project to a lower dimension and use this to use uh, to solve lower dimensional hamilton jacobi bellman equation. Projecting these parameters to full dimensional process gives us the estimator. And yeah, with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question you might have. <laughs>